We shall be reading from the letter to Titus, the epistle of Paul the Apostle to Titus, chapter 3. Remind them to subject to rulers and authorities, to obey, to be ready for every good work, to speak evil of no one, to be peaceable, gentle, showing all humility to all men. For we ourselves were also once foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving various lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. But when the kindness and the love of God our Saviour toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to His mercy, He saved us through the washing of regeneration a renewing of the Holy Spirit, whom He poured out on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Saviour, that having been justified by His grace we should become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. This is a faithful saying, and these things I want you to affirm constantly, that those who have believed in God should be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable to men, but avoid foolish disputes, genealogies, contentions and strivings about the law, for they are unprofitable and useless. Reject a divisive man after the first or second admonition, knowing that such a person is warped and sinning, being self-condemned. When I sent Artemis to you, or Tychicus, be diligent to come to me at Nicopolis, for I have decided to spend the winter there. Send Zenus, the lawyer, and Apollos on the journey with haste, that they may lack nothing. And let our people also learn to maintain good works to meet urgent needs, that they may not be unfruitful. Or who are with me, me greet you. Greet those who love us in the faith. Grace be with you all. Amen. The letter of Apostle Paul to Titus is at the end. The goal is the correction of the church. When we say church, we mean and the pastor and the elders and the deacons and all the people. And correction is done not with man's logic nor with persuasive words of men's wisdom but only with the word of God and the guidance of the Holy Spirit. Finishing, Apostle Paul says something which he has said many times, remind them to be subject to rulers and authorities. You see that the Lord accepts rulers and authorities which are in the world. He does not only accept them, but he reveals that he himself puts them there. I want with the grace of Christ to go to see how Peter explains this which is very very important because a Christian in the surroundings in which he lives he is not out of control he's not out of the laws of the government on the contrary he is obliged to submit himself to the laws and to form, reform himself with the laws of the government. And that is the proof that the church is humble. To reform herself in submission, of course, always, if the laws of the government, and this happens always, when the laws of the government agree with the word of God and the gospel of Jesus Christ. It says in the second chapter of Peter in verse 13. Therefore submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake. Every ordinance of man, institution of man, in a government, the commandment of the Lord is for the church of Christ to respect it and the people of God to respect it with total obedience and submission and this not for people's sake not so they can be pleasing before people but for the Lord's sake a Christian is always 
obeying the law, submitting himself in reality to the Lord. Or to governors, sorry, whether to the king as supreme, or to governors as to those who are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of those who do good. For this is the will of God, that by doing good you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men, as free, yet not using liberty as a cloak of, for vice, but as bondservants of God. My beloved brethren, a servant of God submits himself to God and all the commandments of the Word of God. He is a good citizen. He is a good man. He is a good neighbor. In everything, the servant of God is distinguished for his wisdom, his goodness, his love. Otherwise, there is danger for as the Word of God says, the name of the Lord to be blasphemed because of us. You cannot say that you are Christian and be illegal and steal from the tax department. You cannot say that you are a Christian and for you to go against the laws and break the laws because the question that will arise will be, what kind of a Christian are you? A Christian therefore walks and the Church of Christ walks totally, completely according with the legislations of the government and this knowing, acknowledging and believing that the Lord has put authorities in this world. The only exception which there is and we shall see this is after the rapture of the church when the Antichrist will be revealed. There, my beloved brethren, man then will be in great difficulty, a man of God not the Church of Christ, but the Church of Christ will have left. A man of God, a man who believes in God, because he will be found in a difficult position for the sake, for the Word of God's sake, to go against the law then, and the basic law then will be for him to put the mark. But let's be careful. There are laws which are optional and laws which are compulsory. For example, the compulsory law is that when the light is green, you go. When it's red, you stop. But there's also an optional law which says you can get married a first, second and third time. You're not obligated and God has put things in that way. So the compulsory laws are such in which man can obey them. But to the optional laws, legislations, and we thank God because this is the grace of God. Try and find the optional laws and the compulsory laws, the legislations. You will see that what is compulsory, it's also in the Word of God. And what is optional, it gives a freedom to man to transgress the law of God. And that's why continuing as we read, Ap Apostle Peter says, as free, because a Christian is free from everything. Whoever the Son frees, he is free indeed. He's not under legislations. We are all in heaven, but as free, free from sin, and from the legislations of men, and even the law of Moses, as free people, we do not use our liberty as a cloak for vice, but we use our freedom as bondservants of God, submitting ourselves in all to the will of God. And the will of God is wise, and the will of God is wise also. I have sat trying to find the optional and the compulsory legislations, and I saw in amazement that all the optional laws, most of them, go contrary with the Word of God. For example, as we said, marriage, abortion, divorce, for a man to get married with another man, these are optional legislations. 
compulsory laws that are in the Word of God, and that is a miracle on its own, in which God puts in that she makes the law a beautiful miracle. And that's why we trust the Word of God, because it's never mistaken, never mistaken. We, as people, make mistakes, but the Word of God does not. It is worth trusting the Word of God and following it. Because not only will you go on in safety, a clean path, pure path, holy, but you shall walk with the help of God. You will have God's favor. You will have God's blessings. And not only the help and the favor of God, but something which is much, much greater. Christ will be glorified in your life. But when we start and watering our wine and we compromise with the Word of God, then all these things start to decrease. And when our heart is warped, doesn't care about the Word of God, has no fear of God inside of us, then we lose everything. It's a balance. There is the cold and the hot. Cold is totally out of the will of God. Hot is totally in the will of God. But there's also something in between, in which before God is not pleasing at all, it's he who is lukewarm, who is in the word of God, in the presence of God, but just a bit, just a bit. This doesn't matter, that doesn't matter. And his conscience is in a good situation. I believe in God. I pray. I read the word of God. I go to church. But let's not be so fanatic. He calls him who is faithful a fanatic. But a Christian is not a fanatic. He is true. And God is with him. For the lukewarm, he says, I will vomit you out. Take you out. I cannot have you under my protection and for you to say, it doesn't matter. I will take you out of my protection so you can see if it matters or not. Because the obedience in the gospel of Jesus Christ, my brethren, is necessary. And blessed is a man who sees it as his legislation. And the word of God has details, very important details. Now we started from the law of Moses. Who commanded laws many and difficult as was circumcision, for example, of men, or was the commandment do not desire other things, and some were possible to be done, but some were not. For example, circumcision was possible, the father took his son and circumcised him, and it was done. But when the boy grew up, and was into this temptation, desire, can you hold your heart not to desire? Whatever the Lord might say, do not desire, can you hold your heart? And the law of God has things that can be done, and things that cannot be done, cannot be done. And they are all profitable. Now, I'd like to read something. We'll go to Romans chapter 2. Romans chapter 2. It's a little poor to the Romans chapter 2 and verse 25. It says, For circumcision is indeed profitable if you keep the law. And Apostle Paul says this Circumcision is indeed profitable. If you keep the law, in other words, if you do the law, circumcision is profitable. And if it is profitable, why in the New Testament does God come and say, you don't need circumcision? So in here, there's two different opinions. It is profitable, but it's not profitable. And then also, if you are circumcised, you have fallen from grace. 
for us to see, my beloved brethren, the truth of things, and if circumcision is profitable or not. Of course, this isn't our basic issue, but let's go. Let's go to Genesis. Genesis chapter 17 verse 3 Chapter 17 verse 3 The book of Genesis Then Abraham fell on his face And God talked with him saying As for me, behold my covenant is with you And you shall be a father of many nations No longer shall your name be called Abraham But your name shall be Abraham for I have made you a father of many nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful. And I will make nations of you, and kings shall come from you. And I will establish my covenant between me and you, and your descendants after you in their generations, for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and your descendants after you. Also I'll give to you and your descendants after you the land in which you are a stranger, or the land of Canaan, as an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. So therefore God visits Abraham and gives him a new covenant. A covenant which is everlasting, as he called him from Abraham to Abraham, which means a father of many nations. And the promise which God gave Abraham was... I who bless will bless you, I who multiply will multiply you, and your seed will be like the stars in heaven and the sand around the beach. A great promise, and I will be your God and God of your descendants after you. But it continues in verse 9, and God said to Abraham, As for you, you shall keep my covenant, you and your descendants after you throughout their generations. This is my covenant which you shall keep between me and you and your descendants after you. Every male child among you shall be circumcised and you shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskins and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and you. Circumcision therefore was a sign and a man who circumcised himself and his child, he became automatically part of the promise of God, a part of the promises of God towards Abraham. And that's why Israel and the proselytes circumcised themselves and were part of the people of God, the godly people of God. That's why circumcision was profitable, because with circumcision a man of God became and we'll see that, became partaker of the promises of God towards Abraham. Of course, it was, wasn't only circumcision in which man could do from the law. What did God show? Here's a way. This is what God showed a man. Here's a way, which is the law. And when you do this law, you will reach to everlasting life. But as we said before, many things could happen, but many things couldn't. Man could do a few things, but not all. And so man failed through the law to win the promises of God. And that's why God, in His goodness and His everlasting plan, sent Jesus Christ and said, through Jesus Christ, you are here and you want to reach there. The road is the law. But I have a new way to show you, a new road which does not cancel the law of Moses, but it overtakes it. And you are, with the grace now, in succeeding your goal, which is a sign of the succeeding in your goal, you will never reach by the law, which is there still. That's why Jesus Christ did not come to cancel the law, but He came to fulfill it and for Himself, and for all of us who accept it. How? With the grace, through faith. And whoever accepts Jesus Christ, reach the end of the promise, obtaining the promise of God towards Abraham, by grace. And that it needs circumcision as a sign of the promise.
the circumcision of the flesh, because God brought a new circumcision as a sign, which is the circumcision of the heart. In other words, being born again. In those times, in the Old Testament, the people of God were distinguished by God even by the sign of circumcision, which was the sign of the covenant. And that's why when Moses, before the law was given, took the commandment from the Lord to free the people of Israel and started with his wife, Sephora, the Lord was before him to kill him because he hadn't circumcised his sons. In other words, he wasn't in the people of God. He wasn't a man who could be a partake of the promises of God towards Abraham. But when Sephora circumcised the children, then God let Moses go and did not kill him and let him go on in the work of God, God's holy work. Today, therefore, we have another sign. Then it was a sign of circumcision of the flesh. The people of God, the people of God, Israel, and the proselytes who were circumcised. But of course, circumcision was profitable since you did the law of God. You did the law, but when you stopped doing the law, then circumcision was not profitable. And man lost the promise of God which was given from God to Abraham. And it was to him as if he wasn't circumcised. But today, God has sent Christ, and we are not saved by the law. As it says in verse 4, we were reading in the letter to Titus, chapter 3, verse 4, But when the kindness and the love of God, our Saviour, toward man appeared, the Father, not by works of righteousness which we have done, the law, but according to His mercy, He saved us through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit, whom He poured out on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Saviour. The Father therefore sent Jesus Christ, who did not cancel the law or circumcision, He fulfilled it. And the law was fulfilled to us through love, since he gave the sign of the New Testament, the New Covenant, and which is the circumcision of the heart, the love of God, in other words, is poured in our hearts through the Holy Spirit. Our hearts from a heart of stone become a heart of flesh. That is the circumcision of the heart. So, our Father sent Jesus Christ God, through Jesus Christ, by God's mercy, He saved us through the washing of regeneration, washing of being born again, and renewing, and building again through the Holy Spirit. And so, God takes man who is a transgressor in exile from paradise because of Adam's first sin. He washes him again with the washing of regeneration. He renews him through the Holy Spirit. And this man now, with a circumcised heart and not of his flesh, he has the sign of the people of God being born again. He is part of the people of God, children of God. They have the promise of Abraham by grace. They don't have to fulfill the law of Moses now because they overtook it with Jesus Christ. They reached the goal and now they are waiting their resurrection. They are waiting Christ to come and receive that church. This people, which is a holy nation, chosen people, people in which the Father bought with the blood of Jesus Christ for Himself. And so, we, in this way, are the Church of Christ. Do we need now to be circumcised? Even though it is profitable, we don't need it, because all the law we obtain through Jesus Christ. To us, therefore, circumcision has no gain, because we accepted Christ. 
until man accepts Christ, you need circumcision. And what will you say now? Shall we circumcise ourselves? No, we will not circumcise other people. But we will talk about Jesus Christ to other people. As we were saved through the grace of Christ. And that is the period of grace. All people to be saved with the grace of Christ. To that church now the word of God comes and says, Be careful now, you who are circumcised in the heart, for you to be peaceable, gentle, showing all humility to all men. The word of God tells us things in which man must hear and believe and accept, but he cannot do. Natural man cannot have all ways or humility. Man cannot be always peaceable. Man, natural man cannot be always gentle. But the Word of God tells us this and doesn't say things which cannot be done. But the Word of God tells us things that which are here now are impossible for men but possible for God because we and you before we were born again we were foolish deceived disobedient serving various lusts and pleasures living in malice and envy hateful and hating one another until the kindness and the love of God came and saved us, not by the works of righteousness, by, but by the grace of Christ. And now, what is written, my brethren, it's not legislations, which is impossible, but it's a way of life, a natural way of life. This is how a Christian should live naturally. Whoever is born through the Holy Spirit from above, he cannot sin. He cannot sin. It's like the pig and the lamb. A pig lives in mud. A lamb cannot live in the mud. He cannot. And if it gets dirty, it runs and wipes itself, washes itself. It's like a wild olive tree, no matter how you prune it. You take care of it, when it will make fruit, it will bring forth wild olives that can't be eaten. But when you graft it, and you cut all the other branches and leave only that branch which you have grafted, then a new olive will grow on the same root. But this new olive tree will make good olives. And if you don't water it or prune it, I have olive trees. Mahalday house, they haven't been pruned at all. When they make bring forth olives, they have good olives because they are grafted. And it's a nice example. When I go by them, I see them and I say, poor trees, no one has pruned them. But they do bring forth good olives. A few. But if they are good farmers, we have our father who prunes us, takes care of us, then not only we will we bring forth good fruit, but lots of fruit also. That's why. And it continues now the word of God in a nice direction. This is a faithful saying. And these things I want you to affirm constantly that those who have believed in God should be careful to maintain good works. Knowing all these things about being born again washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit, the work of God, the law which you have taken over by with Jesus Christ. Now you have a new life before you, a life in which you will not do in suffering and by force and in a suppressive way. The work of God is not done in a suppressive way. That's why my brethren never, never suppress anyone, small, young, old, no one at all. Nothing by force. No matter how much you force someone, he will not be able to do the will of God if God doesn't put it in his heart firstly. Whatever you might do, 
It's like a wild olive tree. Whether you prune it, water it, the olives it will bring forth will be wild. But if someone goes and grafts it and cuts everything else and then it will bring forth good olives. That's why the Word of God is faithful. What does that mean? Strong. Not in power but ability. The Word of God is faithful. What it says for you to do, you can't do it now. Because if you go to an alcoholic and say, don't drink again. And that poor man doesn't want to drink again. And he labors and struggles to go to sleep without even drinking a drop. But when he wakes up in the morning, he'll be trembling all over. He cannot stand. If another day goes by, he'll be hurting. He'll be in pain. He cannot stand. Someone who plays cards, he has a passion for it. He goes home and says, I swear to God, I will not play cards again. He has lost one house. The next day, the other house. Two cards. He cannot cut it out. Someone who takes heroin. He cannot cut it out. He cannot stop it. Someone who's in the world and is enjoying the world, is enjoying sin. He cannot stop it. Someone says he's in love with his wife's bridesmaid. He cannot stop it. What must happen now? Someone must come and graft him. And that someone is not you or me, another man. The only one who can is our Father in Heaven through Jesus Christ. And now He comes with the washing of regeneration, washes Him. And there goes sin, and there goes desire, and there goes alcohol, there goes heroin, and there goes a bridesmaid. Everything goes away. And what happens now? A holy man of God, not a religious person, who fears hell. A Christian does not fear hell. Because he has cut any kind of relationship with devil and his abidings. A Christian fears God. He doesn't fear God in case God throws a thunderbolt and kill him. But he fears God and is frightened in case he saddens God. He loves God. He doesn't want to sadden God. When you love someone, you don't want to sadden him. You fear. You're frightened in case you sadden him. That's why a Christian fears no one. Because he fears God. But man who does not fear God fears everything else. You see how people fear death, for example. You know, this man died. Not gone wood. What are you saying? As if you'll be sad to live, you're not gone wood. Others use other superstitious things. I used to do these things also before I believed. But Christ freed me now. He saved me. From these things. And I kissed the cross which I had all the time. And it was empty, the cross I had. It was wooden and inside it was empty. And I put various things in it. From Jerusalem to North Pole. Where I find holy things, artifacts, I used to put them in that cross. And when I left and I forgotten it by my bath, I trembled. What will happen to me now? Instead of it keeping me safe, I kept it safe in case I lose it. Unless it rusts, I kept it safe. It didn't keep me safe. But when Christ came and bore me again, I said, You kept me safe. You, your little cross, kept me safe. And I said, said to myself, The Lord of powers is keeping me safe. The Lord of powers keeps us safe, my brethren. Glory, glory to God. There was a brother who before he believed, he had a bat on him. Always, head in his pocket. It was as big as a slipper. And wherever he went, he took the bat with him. And when he believed, he looked at the bat and said, You kept me safe. See, my beloved brother, how man can be deceived from the devil, from his heart, from the world. He li lives in deception. But now that Christ has freed us, now we have work to do. Now we have good work before us. So, the believers must be careful to maintain good works. Not for them to be saved by good works, but because we have been saved, they have to maintain good works. Because these things are good and profitable to men. Good works, which are the works of faith. 
These are what a good and profitable two men. And how are they profitable? It's something great for you to be able. I'll read this in verse 14. And let our people also learn. In other words, we, the church of Crete, the church of Cephasia, let our people also learn to maintain good works to meet urgent needs. Here we have a very nice expression. Only in Greek can describe it properly, but in English it is to meet urgent needs. Urgent needs, needs which are necessary in other words. In necessary things, totally necessary. For you to maintain good works to a family which hasn't got anything to eat, hasn't got money to pay its rent, can't pay the electricity bill, has difficulties. For example, I'm you will not help a family who owns a Volkswagen car to buy a BMW. That's not an urgent need. The responsibility of the church and the brethren is to meet urgent needs. And the good and profitable of all this is that they may not be unfruitful. To be a tree that brings forth much fruit, good fruit, for its fruit to remain. And Christ says, in this my Father is glorified, for you to bring much fruit and your fruit to remain. A Christian unfruitful, who is unfruitful, I won't exaggerate, but if he goes to heaven, he will go through the fire. Only they who enter through the fire go without, without fruit, without work. But on the contrary, we, we do not want to go to heaven with fruit, but we want to go and our reward there to be full, complete. Whatever God has prepared for you to do in your life, this life, ask from God to give you grace to do it. All that God has prepared, because it says in the letter to the Phaeacians, our beloved Paul, brother Paul, that it is chapter 2 of the letter to the Phaeacians, verse 8, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. God has prepared good works for each one of us, lots of work, in which we must be careful so we can walk exactly in these works, so we can bring much fruit in this life, so we can obtain there, before the platform of, platform of Christ, our reward in full. So, the good and profitable for us, is for us to maintain good works, to be careful of all the small foxes which destroy the fruit, if we let them enter into the vineyard. A small fox can destroy the grapes. Let's be careful therefore of we should be careful to avoid foolish disputes. Do not quarrel. But he said that, I said that. Why did he say that? Let foolishness aside. It will make your fruit go rotten. It will spoil. It will lessen your reward. Instead of you having to do with good works, you will have to do with disputes, foolish disputes, genealogies. What does that mean? For us to say, whose fault it is? Who said that? Why he said that? What did he mean? Oh no, where it came from? Leave these things aside, brethren. I like this expression very much. God, for us, to overcome the law, 
He did bypass surgery. And for you to overtake the difficulties, my brethren, overtake them. Pretend you're a fool. Pretend you don't understand. Pretend that you can't hear and go on. Go on. Do not tangle yourself with these things. Overtake them. All people, all the people of God, when the devil sent someone to delay them, to mock them, make them angry. They pretend they did not understand. They pretend they were a fool. You know, who falls in the trap? The smart one, who wants to solve everything, take care of everything. And he said that to me, and I must take care of it. Don't take care of everything. Let God take care of everything. You just overtake the problem and go there where God wants you to be, in good works in which God has prepared for you to do. Divisions. Contentions, strivings about the law, flee, for they are. The good works are profitable and good, but these are unprofitable and useless. All these delays are unprofitable and useless, and they offer you nothing, and if they do offer you something, it will be damage. Someone wants to say something to you. Let me tell you what he said about you. I don't want to listen. I'm leaving. And you know what happened there? I don't want to know. I'm leaving. And the less a Christian knows of bad things, he's more safe. On the contrary, whatever is good, the Word of God tells us, and I like this verse also, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are are of good report. Meditate on these things. The scandals overtake them. Lies overtake them. What's unjust? Pretend you don't understand. What's dirty? Don't touch it. What is of good report? Listen to it with all cautiousness. What is of bad report? Close your ears. It is useless and unprofitable. But there is also something which is very important, so we won't lose our time. All these things are not great sins, but they are small delays. But they will decrease the blessings of God. Decreasing the blessings of God in your life. But there is something which brings great delay also. A divisive man, after the first and second admonition, Knowing that such a person is warped and sinning. Now, here's a man, a man who is divisive. And this word has no reputation in our country. Whoever does not agree with me is divisive. The word of God does not say this. Whoever isn't a Catholic is a heretic. Whoever isn't an Orthodox for the Orthodox is a heretic. Whoever isn't a Protestant for the Protestants, he is heretic. That's a mistake. A mistake, a great mistake, deception, and I will say that it's even from the devil. A divisive man, a heretic man, is the man who has doctrine of destruction, of deception. And a heretic man, it is he who hasn't got the mystery of godliness, which is great, that God was manifested in the flesh. He is heretic. Do not believe. It says. In the letter of John, in all spirits, my brethren, but test the spirits if they are from God. Chapter 4 Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you know the Spirit of God. We see now who is heretic. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard was coming and is now already in the world. Or have to do with the faith or not the faith that God became man. In other words, for us, are the Orthodox heretic? No. What are they? In, they are deceived. 
they have subtracted, added, they have been deceived. But they believe that God is one, that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. That's what their theology says. But if people believe it or not, I doubt it a lot. Because they go and say, I know many people, who, and even priests, Christ has risen, truly has risen. And I said to them, do you believe that Christ has risen? And he said to me, let's not exaggerate. Do you believe in everlasting life? Has anyone seen it? They said to me, but this, my brethren, isn't being heretic. Even in the end, it is, but it is called deception. Because they did not believe that God did not come in the flesh. They, they cannot accept the truth of the gospel, which is a gift from God. The Bible says, through faith you are saved. And this is a gift from God. Does it say the faith is a gift from God? This, all of this, that you were saved because you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of the living God, the Word of God which became flesh, all this is a gift of God. Man cannot believe like that. It's a mystery. This corruptible has put on incorruption. And this mortal will put on immortality. Then shall be brought to pass a saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. How can this happen? We don't know how this will happen. Through the Holy Spirit it will happen. But we believe it. Because we trust the Word of God. And faith, my brethren, is a fruit of the Holy Spirit. In other words, when man is born again, then he believes truly. When man is born again by the Word of God and the Holy Spirit, at once in him the fruit of the Holy Spirit is born. There are not many fruits, there is only one fruit of the Holy Spirit. Peace, love, patience, faith, gentleness, self-control. Faith. Let's not delay anything. Let's not let anything delay us in the work in which God has prepared for us, brethren. And finishing verse 15. Apostle Paul expresses his love. All who are with me greet you. Because in the church of Christ there is a nice characteristic. The unity of faith the union of faith and Christians are all one with the connection of perfection which is love and one hope that Jesus Christ is coming to receive us so there is nothing left now but love faith and hope and that being one again that Christians are one the church of Christ is one isn't in theory it is totally natural. We are one body. Someone is the eye, someone is the ear, leg, no, but we are one body. And all the body, the healthy body, takes commandments from the head. And we are all one, and we take commandments. A hand doesn't get a commandment from the other hand, nor does the eye get a commandment from another eye. We all receive commandments only from the head. Hallelujah. Only from the head. And we thank God for that. In our midst, therefore, and in the church of Christ, there is no leader, no chief. There is no one who rules or reigns. In the church of Christ, there are servants. And not servants of men, but servants of God. All, all who are with me greet you, therefore. Greet those who love us in the faith. Those who don't love us, don't greet them. They are not in the body of Christ. They are not part of the body of Christ, those who do not love their brother. From this we know we have everlasting life, that we love our brethren. And that is the characteristic of the church. People will see your love. And they will acknowledge that you are my disciples. But when you do not love one, you are those who say, greet those who love us in the faith. 
you are not in those at all. You have put yourself out of the body of Christ when you don't love. You are out. You have separated yourself. There cannot be two people in the church of Christ for one not to love the other. In, in the church, my brethren, love, faith and hope. Grace be with you all. Amen. May God bless us all.